All right, okay, let's get started. So guys, uh, welcome to 351, Introduction to Energy Systems. All right, so uh, my name is Falson, so I'll be the instructor for this quarter. So this is a introduction class, introductory class to broad spectrum of power energy systems. So we'll cover in the class all the way from wind and solar generation to uh, conventional generators. Right? And uh, we'll touch on the grid, we'll look at pyrotronics, so this fairly broad set of topics in this class. So before we sort of dive into the class, uh, some introduction material. Right? So, so first about me, right? So I've been here since uh, 2015. I taught this class uh, many times now. This is the first time I'm teaching this virtually, so we'll see how it goes, but I did teach this class many times. And uh, so my research, my personal research interests uh, are on power system control optimization, and nowadays some sort of data and uh, machine learning in power systems. Right? So in this class, I would, of course, this is sort of a basics class, but throughout this class, I'll try to point out some places where we are now, where the grid is changing, right? Why the power system is very different today than say 20 years ago, and then why, you know, in 20 years we expect the power system to, you know, look drastically different to, compared to today. Right? So throughout the class, I'll, you know, different places, I'll point out what is changing in the grid, what is easy to change, what is hard to change, what are some of the open questions we have uh, in the power and energy system today. So how to contact me, right? So uh, my office hours are 3.30 to 4.30 Fridays. You can find the link on the course website. Uh, you all, you're welcome to email me to schedule another time to talk. Right? So, you know, so you, if, you, if you can't make the office hour, then uh, email me, we'll schedule some other time to meet. And then, so we have two TAs. I think their office hour now are determined. I think you also are on Tuesdays from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, it's a Thursday. Uh, oh, Thursday? All right, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll correct this on the course website. Thursday, 2 to 3 p.m. They eat us as Monday, 4.30 to 5. Okay, so you can find the link on the course website. So with that, uh, so the TAs, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, do you want to say a few words? Uh, yeah, um, now I'm a fifth year PhD student in the UCE department and I have been working as TA for several times and um, so that's pretty much all about me. And you can find the Zoom link to my office hour on the course website. And welcome to join, uh, welcome to ask me any questions regarding this course. Okay, Isu, you want to say a few words? Uh, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Isu, and uh, yeah, just the uh, same as you. I'm a final year, as a fifth year PhD student uh, at Udo. Uh, I actually work with Boston, and uh, uh, my research has been closely related to power systems. So we work in different methods, say optimization, some control theory. Uh, some machine learning to say how to bridge all the series into a uh, current uh, clean energy system as well as power system. Uh, I hope everyone can join this course and uh, my TA session is just uh, right after today's lecture and uh, everyone can come and ask me any questions. Thank you. Right, okay, thanks guys. Right, so the idea of having this office hour is the labs will be a big part of this class. Right, so this class, you know, there will be, there's four lab sessions actually in the class, right? So the idea is to give you guys a chance to ask the TAs about your lab session. And also I plan to have the homework due on Thursday. So the midnight, uh, so 11.59 p.m. on Thursday. So these will give you a chance to look at homework and ask any questions you may have with homework. Uh, so thanks, Yao and Isa. So, you know, do, you know, do email them, do ask them questions. They probably will reply to email much faster than me. 
Right, so next, uh, so course organization. Right? So everything uh, will be communicated, communicated through this website. Right? This is sort of the main course website we'll use. You'll find the homework assignments, you'll find the lab menus once they're out, you'll find the copy of slides. Uh, I try to be sort of uh, give you at least one week ahead being on the slides. And then you'll find the recorded lectures. So you'll find the record, so all the lectures are recorded, you'll find them. Posted on the website. So the in the past few quarters, so what I've been doing is I've just been uploading to YouTube, which seems to be an easier way for people to view them. So do any of you have problem accessing YouTube? So if, right, so if that's the issue, let me know. I will upload somewhere else. But if nobody has issues accessing YouTube, then I'll just upload to a channel on YouTube, which is easier to view and easier to sync across devices. All right, okay, so in this class, we'll have a reference book, not a textbook. So the cl this class is largely built on this book. This is by Mohammed al Shakawi, called Luxury Energy Introduction. Right? So if you look at the slides, a lot of slides comes out of this book. But we're not requiring this as a textbook. Right? So the reason is one, this book is a little bit out of date. There are some errors also in the textbook. But you know, unfortunately, Professor Asher Kelly has since passed away. So it's unlikely we'll update the book. But then, you know, because one is outdated, second there's errors, it's hard to use as a textbook. But you're welcome to use this as a reference book if you want. So a lot of materials will be drawn from the book, but there's no guarantee every equation in the book is correct. And uh, we won't debug the equations in the book. Right? So the equations on the slides uh, will be, you know, you, you should use, the, if there's a difference, you should use the equations on the slides. Okay. So this is homework. So homework will be, so this course is graded through three components of homework, exams, and uh, the labs. So the homework will be assigned weekly. This will be due on the following Thursdays. to sync with the lab a little bit better, right? So the homework will be submitted via Canvas. So once the homework is posted, there'll be a link and uh, you submit, you, know, you can submit the homework. So it's fairly standard homework for uh, five or six questions, covering the material we have done in class and the exam will largely draw on the homework questions. So, and the labs is a little bit uh, interesting this time around, right? So how to, he... normally in the past, we have three experiments. And this course, actually a large part of the course is about labs. Right? So if you look at the course design, the course is basically designed entirely around having these three labs. So we have a lab on electronics, we have a lab on PV, uh, photovoltaics generation, I will have a lab on the larger box scale power systems. Right? But now, of course, this quarter, the labs will be virtual. And this virtual labs present some difficulty because the point of the labs was try to give you a chance to look at the sort of, you know, real, not non-ideal, components we're using the system, right? So we, we, we have made the labs virtual, which we sort of tried a few times now for 351. Uh, we'll update it this quarter. So Yao and Yizu will have you know, much more to say about the labs in a few weeks once we get them finalized and get all the details worked out for the labs. But this quarter we'll have, you know, we have, uh, we have, uh, yeah, so, so we just, uh, we have to hold them virtually. So we'll try to give you, you know, the most 
uh, sort of practical feeling of these components of what will happen when you try to build a system that describes in class. I will try to do this through the virtual labs. And then the exam is, so they will have two exams, the midterm and the final, each 25%. So these will be remote exams. And because they're remote exams, uh, so we'll just make them open everything. Okay, you, have your, you can use your book, computer, internet, you can Google stuff if you want. Right? So as long as there's no communication, between the students, then as you know, you can use whatever you want for the exams, right? The same thing goes for the homework. Okay. So this is the exam situation. So 25% for homework, 25% for the labs, and 25% each for the uh, midterm and the final. Any questions about this logistics of the class? So do we not have to go to our lab section until week four then? Yeah, so your lab section will start at week four. So we'll send an email when you should start go to lab session. The lab mm -hmm. will start at the earliest in week four. Any other questions? So for the, um, for the lab, is a individual lab or the group lab? Uh, which we should be group lab. We don't know the group of how many because we have to see how many students are in each section. So we imagine it will be a group of two or three. So this will be something the TAs will sort out with you once you go to your lab. Thank you. I had a question as well. Yeah. Um, do you know when the midterm would be? I don't know. So I can... Midterm will be probably the sixth week of class. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact day. I haven't, so I haven't decided the Monday or the Wednesday. We have to see you know, where exactly we get to. Okay, thank you. And another thing I'll try to do, uh, we'll try to have the midterm, we'll try to avoid having two midterms on the same day for you guys. Right? So since uh, this is, so I think all midterms are remote nowadays. And then they're all sort of take home one day long. So you may get two on the same day. So we'll try to avoid that. So we'll try to schedule it to not, you know, if you have an already another midterm scheduled on that, uh, on that day, we'll try to schedule on the other day. We'll try to sort of avoid having too many midterms on the same day. Final, there's nothing we can do about it. Right? Final, I think it's June 8th. That's not in our control, but midterm will try to you know, probably be a six week of the quarter and then hopefully not on the same day as another midterm. Are their homeworks uh, done individually or can, can they be done in groups? Homework are individually, homework are done individually. So you can and uh, you should talk to each other if you have, uh, if you run into difficulty with homework, right? So that's one thing about this virtual setting is it's hard to sort of replicate this kind of uh, group work. So definitely if you can find some way to work together, that's, that's fine. But when you write down the solutions, you should write your own solution. Right? So don't, you know, don't copy each other's solutions. Right? You can discuss about how to solve the homework. You can go over the steps, but when you actually write it down, you should do your own calculations. And that's quite easy to tell if there's sort of people are copying each other. Right? So that's yeah, so quite easy to tell. So please, you know, do talk among each other, but uh, write your own solution. So the labs will be in groups and the lab report you'll write together as a group. Any other questions about this? Okay, all right. So another thing was the logistics. Another thing about the class is We'll try to get some outside speakers for this class, sort of half hour uh, talks for people from industry, for example, to talk about you know, what is actually the job like 
if say you get a power and gain degree, right? What do you do actually day to day when you go to work? So we're in the process of lining up speakers. We'll see how many we can get. But once we have a, uh, once they make a firm commitment, I'll announce that. And so if you're interested in the research side of things, then some of you may have went to the seminar series last quarter. So last quarter's ECE, Cloakham seminar series was on power, uh, power system, power electronics research. So you can watch that on YouTube to get a good idea of what the research is like for power energy. So for this class, I'll try to get some people who's in the industry, for example, works on this kind of stuff from utilities, uh, from vendors, from sort of this uh, smaller startup companies, try to give an idea of what you actually do in these companies. But we'll see sort of who we can get and uh, whether they can commit half an hour to give a lecture. All right, okay, so also another thing is, you know, in this class, you have questions, please ask, right? If anywhere you're confused, please ask. Because, you know, from, I, I know sort of virtual studying is hard for you guys, right? So it's not the way I would want to take a class. But also from the instructor side, as when we talk right now, I'm basically talking into a screen, right? I don't see any, so I see a bunch of names and that's all I see on the screen, right? So. Uh, if you don't ask questions, then uh, it's really boring after talking to a computer screen for two hours, right? So if you have questions, please ask. Okay, so we'll try to have as much discussion as possible in this class. All right, so this is the logistics of class. So uh, do I prefer camera on or off? So it's up to you for camera on or off. So for me, it'll be easier if you know I have more camera on to have some faces look at. Uh, right now, I'm looking at my own, yeah, my. But uh, it's up to you, right? So if you can turn it on, you know, uh, uh, be nice, turn it on for me to have somebody talk to. You, but it's turned off is okay. But then as long as there's questions, that'll be good, right? So be you know, I don't want to talk for an hour with no interruption and no, no questions, right? So that way, you know, we'll finish the class very early, but then you, know, we, you probably won't get as much out of us, right? So, right, so try, to, you know, try to ask uh, questions, try to, anywhere you're confused, try to ask questions, okay? So rest of the class, uh, sorry, so this class will start with the you know, uh, introduction to look, look a little bit at history of the power systems. So power system really, you know, all the way until the 19th century, right? So if you look at, you know, back to ancient history, of course, people knew electricity, people had a good idea of electricity, have some idea of electricity. But without us, you know, this sort of interesting physical phenomena, that's pretty interesting physical phenomena, but maybe not as, as pra practically very useful up until the mid 19th century, right? So at that time we're building understanding of circuits and EM theory, but still wasn't, you know, day to day life didn't make a big difference. And really that changed, really that changed until the, mid to late 19th century. So there was two big applications for power. Right? So mid to late 19th century, this really when actually power as an industry, as a practical industry took off, right? become an engineering subject rather than a physics subject. So we're based because of two applications. So those two main applications that made power a sort of two, uh, yeah, two technology domains, let's say this. I can, so what are the two domains, right? So, right, so one, so I'm gonna tell you the easy one. The first one is electricity, 
for lighting. Right? So this is just light bulbs, right? So this is light and machines. So these are the motors and the manufacturers. Right? So one is having electricity when you transmit electricity because I need power for lighting and for machines, okay? for motors, for example. Right? So what was the second application for electricity? So first we need electricity at that time was for you know, light bulbs and things like that. What, what do you think the second application was, the second technology domain was, other than say providing light? Uh, the chest has transportation, not transportation, where we're not, we're not there yet. So that's how transportation was very separate from electricity. Uh, communication, like telegraph or telephone? Right, communication. So that was the second technology domain. As you need power or electricity for telegrams. And that was, you know, and uh, really what electricity was used for. So the second was electricity, not for lighting or heating or running machines. This is for communication. So at that time was the tele, telegram, really was the big telegraph or telephone okay. so until, okay. so this was the two big application domains. Right. So they're sort of evolved independently. They, they are fairly, they evolve fairly independently actually. So these three, this will remain very separate. until all the way until, until the mid 20th century, actually. Okay. So they are evolving, but sort of they're evolving independently. How you got power has very little to do with communication. And then electricity were just seeing us sort of this foundation for communication. Okay. Then, so really what happened from the late 19th century, mid 20th century, if we really went them through the mass electrification, right? So you look at the US power grid, a lot of it was built, right? You know, at or before the mid 20th century, right? Mass electrification. So what was the killer application? So why do we all want electricity? So what was the driving force, right? For you know, every town to get electricity, every home to get electricity from the late 19th century to mid 20th century. What do people really want at that time? See at night. Sorry? Be able to see at night. Not really, actually. This word less important than you would think. Lighting was not actually the critical application. It was not the killer application, actually. Radio? Radio. That's <laughs> what's so radio. Actually, at that time, you look at history, the way, sort of the reason people demanded electricity was radio. Because I really, really want my radio. At that time, was no small, we did not have a small portable batteries yet. So the radios were, you know, this big. I had plugged them in. Right? They had run on electricity. So then yeah, we really want a radio. So this was. Radio was a sort of a, okay, so of course, you know, lighting and things were nice, but at that time it was radio, uh, similar to today, right? You have a choice of having internet at home or having your light at home. I'm guessing most of us will choose internet at home. Okay. So this is similar at that time. Uh, sort of this radio was really just a driving force of having electricity. So then you know, the way you get electricity is actually quite different. It was actually a bit different. So the structure of the companies at providing electricity. So at that time in big cities, we had utilities, we had sort of commercial utilities. Or 
commercial companies. Right, so this is Edison's company, for example. And then in the rural areas, we have so-called electricity cooperatives. And this structure largely remains intact today, actually. So if you go to the state of Washington, you'll find every possible kinds of utilities and cooperatives out there. And there are some utility, for example, Pearson Energy that covers a large urban area. There are some small rural cooperatives that you know, has about a hundred customers. So this is sort of all over the place. And that's because they just, you know, they sort of because history largely, different areas was, you know, have different providers electricity. And then, so if still, if you look at up until the mid 20th century, really power, you, know, you of course the application was radio, but from the power systems perspective, whether it's providing, uh, it's just providing power. Right? It didn't matter what the power was used as. So there was really no intersection. There's no feedback loop between power and communication at that time. But nowadays, really, if you look at the second half of 20th century until now, it's actually quite a close relationship between communication, power, and control. Really, what happened is the asset system grew larger and larger, become more and more complicated. We needed more and more uh, communication control around the electric grid. The electric grid is actually a very large machine with many, many control loops inside of it. So at that time really was a merging of the communication area and the power area. So nowadays we use data acquisition, right? We get data all the time in the grid. We use that to control the systems and then now there's more and more of the control knobs are actually the power electronics in the systems they have. And if you care about our professional society, this really came out of the merging of the power society and the communication society, the IEEE society. Right, so power is sort of the one of the earliest engineering domains. And now this is going under, you know, so it's sort of very early engineering domain, right? The industry has been growing, or industry has been there for a hundred something years now, 150 years, right? So what is the current trend, right? So why are you still learning about this course now, right? So you know, if it's this system has been around for 150 years, why do you care about this system now that's why are you taking this course? So for this, for this, uh, the current trends, if you look at some of the current trends in the system, what you see is really what happening is, you know, you may have all heard the word smart grid, right? So you may have heard the word smart grid. So the, the term smart grid, uh, power engineers, I don't know if they like this term or not, because this implies our old grid was you know, a little bit dumb, right? So well, I need a smart grid. So the old grid somehow wasn't very smart. This is not actually the way to think about, it, right? This is not the way to think about. It. Because the way you should think about how, what, you know, what does smart grid mean? Or what, what does, you know, why are we transition? It's because one as we have, so the challenges in the grid today, right? So the big challenges we have in the grid today, this is renewables. And this really the challenge for us is these are, are uncertain. Okay. Right? We don't know, we don't know how much wind there will be tomorrow. Right? We, we don't know, uh, yeah. we, we hard to forecast renewables. So this is quite challenging to the way the grid system works. Right? If you, again, if you think about it, 
most of the infrastructure of the grid was built 50 years ago. At that time, we yeah, was almost no wind, almost no solar in the grid. Right? So the infrastructure of the grid was not designed to accommodate renewables, but they're coming in nowadays anyways. Right? So that's one big challenge. Another challenge was, was reliability. So we, you know, we all remember what happened in Texas a few months ago, right? The whole grid was very close to collapsing and they need to do rolling blackouts during a very cold winter. Right? So that's obviously not something you want to happen. Right? That's, that's again a example of the grid showing its age. It was not designed to handle all those things, but you know, climate is changing and the renewables are coming online. So these are the challenges we have, sort of the big challenges we have. This is also another thing is we have the loads are changing, right? So for example, we have data centers for computing. They are growing very fast as electric load. We have electric vehicles. Right? So if you look at the Goal we have now is you know, we're going to exponentially increase the number of electric vehicles on the road. If you look at Seattle, we have there's proposals that making all ride-share vehicles electric. There is, I think, the city path ordinance saying that all heating in new buildings has to be electric. Right, so you're putting all this loading to a grid that's 70 years old, right? That's sort of 50, 70 years old. Okay, so that's a lot of challenges in the grid. And the reason you, we want to talk about smart grid or the new grid or changing grid is really to say these are the challenges, right? These are the engineering challenge we have to solve. So what are the tools, right? So what are the new technology, new tools we have, right? One is we're much better, we're much more communication. Okay. We have a lot more communication and sensing capabilities in the system. We have power electronics. Okay. We have a lot more controllable knobs, a lot more controllable components we have. And uh, so, you know, what I work on is better algorithms. Okay. Better algorithms, right? So, how do we, because we have more communication, more control capabilities, how do we do the best resource allocation we can do? How, how do we, right? So for example, if you take a, a compare a electric vehicle versus a light bulb, right? So electric vehicle, of course, is sort of more, much more dynamic load, but also much more controllable. I can program whatever I want into electric vehicle charger uh, compared to some traditional load we have. So the loads are changing and these are creating challenges, but still we have more tools coming into the field. So the idea is to say that if the grid, say, let's say if the grid, if, the, if there's no new challenges after say 1990s, then there's no need to do power engineering. We sort of have solved that problem already. However, the grid is, ch is changing and changing dramatically. There's a lot of challenges that we just didn't think of before. And this, that's where the opportunities are. Right? Actually, that's where opportunities are. Right? So the grid is old, the grid has been around for a long time, but the many, many things are also changing the grid. And this class, one goal is to understand how the existing system works, right? So of course, to change the grid, we still need to understand how things work. You still need to, just because we have a lot more renewables coming in, doesn't mean you don't have to understand how a nuclear power plant works, right? We still need some understanding of that. But at the same time, having eye towards the future, right? Now by the time you enter the workforce, what are the problems you're trying to solve? Right? So that's the thing where, that's the, balance we're trying to strike in this class. 
for some more uh, examples closer to home, to give you what the challenges are. What, what are the you know, pressing issues that uh, we are trying to solve right now in Seattle? Okay. So if you look at the electric load growth in the US, that's roughly flat. We, we are averaging about 1% or lower than 1% electric load growth in the US. So not much, we're not drawing more power. We're not drawing more power in the US. This is largely driven by efficiencies. Right, so all the appliances, all the loads are getting to be much more efficient than before. So although we have sort of economic growth, it's not, you're really not seeing a growth in electric load. Right? However, that doesn't mean the load growth is flat everywhere. Right? If you look at Seattle, for example, so here is a picture of the Danny substation. Right? The substation is in the Danny Triangle area. That's about $200 million. And if you have driven past that area, right, so the need for a new substation is clear. We're building, you know, everything is basically going up in that area. So you need a new substation to take care of the load that's growing in that area. Right? So there's very localized load growth. However, we cannot spend $200 million whenever we have a low growth. Right, we don't have that much money to throw around and you know, upgrade every substation to a $200 million substation. And one interesting thing is the, you know, at UDOF, right, at our own campus. Okay. So if you look at our campus, if you, you know, in the past year, I don't know how many of you have been around campus, but you walk around campus or we're still building. So we're building around campus. There's new building going up. Okay. So our load will expand. So anybody have an idea of what our peak load is? Our Seattle campus. Any guess of how big our load is? Any ballpark guess of, right? So we're a large load. We're the second largest load in Seattle. And we're a large load. Okay. So UW, so our current load, It's about 55 megawatts. This is, our, this is about our current peak load. So to get a you know, ballpark idea how large this is. So each person in the, each, uh, each person in the US consumes on ballpark about one kilowatt. So we're at our campus is about 55 megawatt. Right? So it's equivalent to you know, 55,000 people, which is reasonable. That's about the number of people we have in the working in the campus. So that's a large, very large load. Right. But the, this load, we're running into a problem because our transformer limit is transformer limit. Our transformer capacity is about 60, say five megawatt. It's about 65 megawatt. But if you look at our campus expansion plan, our load will go way beyond 65 megawatt. Basically, we have a load larger than what the transformer can supply. And uh, later in this class, you'll learn why you should never exceed your transformer rating. Okay, do not exceed your transformer rating under any circumstances. Okay, so that's obviously a problem that we have to solve. So we don't actually have a very good solution to this yet. So on one hand, we want to grow the campus, right? There is sort of a clear need to grow the campus. But the transformer is there and has a hard limit. And I don't think anybody wants to build a $200 million transformer station around the campus. Right? So then how do you do it? Right? How do you deal with the fact that here is our infrastructure is very old. We have an old transformer that is just not very big. I wasn't planned for a large campus load. I have campus I need to grow. But what are the new technologies we can use? Right? How do we use solar? How do we use storage? How do we use demand response? How do we control building load? Right? How do we do scheduling? You know, if we're gonna charge luxury vehicles on the parking lot, you know, can we actually do that? 
Right? If we actually go 100% electric vehicles and people drive to school, need to charge their vehicles, how do we do it? I do it, you know, how, how can we do that without blowing up our transformer, blowing up our transmission lines? Right? So these are some of the questions. So right? these are hard questions we're facing today. Right? We don't have a ready-made technology. We don't have a ready-made solution. And they'll come more and more often. Right? So these are the some things we're, you know, where this class will go, you know, we'll try to address this question, give you, get you along the way of addressing these questions. Okay. So the last thing about, you know, what is important for the grid is, right, so then another thing to emphasize what we said earlier is resilience or reliability. Again, the grid is really, really old. It's really, really old. The average age of transformers in the US is about 45 years old. And this, is our own, this is Department of Energy's report. And uh, we're not replacing transformers proactively. We basically wait until a transformer blow up and then replace it, blow up and replace it. So they're getting old. And again, the design philosophy of the grid is really outdated. Like if you look at why the grid is designed the way it's designed, if we have a clean slate of how to design the transmission grid in the US, we won't design like this. This is not how we would design it. But this is a grid we, are, we have. Right? So how do we, what can we do? Right? So what engineering solutions do we have to deal with this? Right? And again, the reason this is on people's mind is we have actually had two large scale outages. We have two large scale outages in the past year. This is really, really rare. This is really, really rare in the US. This is really, really rare. Because this is actually government, we actually have a regulatory agency talking about how many outages you're supposed to have if you're in the US. This is actually, there is regulation about this. So that agency is called NERC. This is a North, North American election. Electricity Reliability Council, I believe, NERC. This actually has a standard. So the standard is no more than one hour of outage in X number of years. Anybody have a guess what this is? What the standard is, right? what it should be? So if you're an electricity provider, if you're a utility provider, every year you actually have to write a report to NERC saying how you did. And the way NERC looks at it is they judge how many outages you have, right? And Eric is writing chat, uh, this is 10 years. Okay. You should have not more than one hour outage in 10 years. I don't think any of, if you're in Seattle, we're definitely not meeting this. And if you're in Texas or California, I don't think you want to see this number. <laughs> This is our standard and we're doing much worse now than say 20 years ago about meeting this standard. Actually, we're not as good at meeting it. Right? So we have California summer 2020, big outage. This is wildfires. And this is manually, basically people have to do rolling blackouts. Okay, so wildfires, this is uh, the transmission lines. Was basically transmission was limited. Right? Because we people had to manually de-energize some lines so that to reduce the wildfire risk. And then what he had to do was rolling back up. Okay? Especially in the Northern California area. And then Texas in the winter 2021, this winter was different because this was sort of not transmission limited. This is co-led to supply limitation. And stability limited. This was were quite limited by supply and stability concerns. Again, this led to rolling blackout all through Texas. Also, Texas. So, 
these are this one event causes hundreds of deaths and uh, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars of damages, right? So uh, maybe the way the NERC standard may not be the right way of thinking about outages anymore. Maybe you have to adapt. But how we adapt and how do we make the grid more resilient? Was it by itself a open question? And the last thing we're going to look at in current trend is right. So if you look at all the hot areas, let's say in machine learning or 5G or whatever, they all require power. And they require a lot of power. This require a lot of power. Right, so this is a picture of a, a sort of a vehicle, right? This is a vehicle where it uses for computer vision and computing to drive itself, right? So, and uh, the problem is the computing component in this vehicle itself consumes 2.5 kilowatts of power, right? Where again, we said a US adult is about one kilowatt of power. So when you're driving this car around, regardless how much this motor is consuming, how much motor is consuming, the computing is consuming a lot more than people. Right? So you know, maybe driverless vehicles, driverless vehicles may be easier for people, but they're definitely not as efficient. Right? One, one person is one, one kilowatt at most, right? Just, but you're replacing that with a 2.5 kilowatt. Just you have basically you have a big battery sitting there just supporting the computing application in a vehicle. So all of these are the new things that we did not think of when we designed the grid. But these are the things we will have to deal with when, when we're going forward. Right. So this is quite an exciting time for power engineering. Right? We have sort of like uh, there's sort of a push from society. Right, to be more sustainable, to fight climate change. And we have all this new technology coming in, either using a lot more power or using power very differently than before, or providing us with the capability of doing sort of more advanced control and optimization. And so it's a good confluence of having the societal push and the technolog technological cap uh, capabilities to solve the problems we have. So that's something to keep in mind while we do the class, while we, while we go through this class. Okay. So more concretely, what are we going to cover in this class? Right? What are those concrete topics we're going to cover in the class? Well, so the topics we're going to cover, really, if you think about it, a logical order Order the way you know most people most schools cover the teach the first uh, power systems power engineering class. So as you look at source of energy, right? Whether from fossil fuels, from renewables. When you look at generation, right? how do you let's say generate power? How do you turn? You know, if you have a solar panel. How does the photons turn into electric current? How do you do transmission? How do you, what, how do we uh, look at the load that are motor loads and then look at power electronics? Right, so this is the logical order of how we're gonna how this class should be covered. But we are not gonna cover the class in this order because we have to comment on the labs. Right, so when I said the labs were these the class was designed around the labs, this is uh, what I meant as we actually shuffle the topics around to fade in the labs. So a little bit you know sad that uh, you won't do physical lab. But who knows, right? Maybe in, in June, before the finals, we can all take a look toward the lab. Maybe that will be possible at that time. We can come to the building and look at all the equipment in the lab. 
Uh, we actually have an underground solar cell in the lab. We have a light, we have a solar panel, we'll shine the light on the solar panel. So look at how solar panels are. Right? So even though we won't be doing the lab, right, who knows, right? Maybe in May, late May or June, we can you know, all walk through the lab and uh, identify with uh, you know, the virtual lab versus the real equipment. Right? But anyways, to accommodate the lab, the way we're gonna cover this class will be, well, first look at AC circuit analysis. This is really the mathematical foundation of power engineering, really, as everything is the AC circuit. Right? Most of the things we teach in the class will be getting to equivalent circuit, do AC analysis on it, and uh, get some answer. That's where 95% of the question in the class will be of that flavor. Okay. We'll go to power electronics. Because the lab, right? So the reason the lab doesn't start for a few weeks is we need to at least get into power electronics for you to know what are the things you're, de you're touching in the lab. Okay. So with the power electronics, with the renewables, we do conventional generation. We'll do three phase. We'll do transformers. We'll look at machines. And then we'll look at, uh, for example, blackouts. Right. How does it ex exactly happen? Right? You know, what are the sequence of events that leads to a blackout? And why, what are the actions? Right? Why, why does a rolling blackout save the system from a complete one? These are some questions to look at. So if you look at the class, if you now think about this in terms of the midterm and the final, basically this will be sort of the midterm. And uh, this will be the final, right? And the conventional you know, generation sometimes fall into one or the other, depending on how fast we go in the class. But this is a rough division of the midterm and the final. And because there's so many topics in this class, the final is not a cumulative final. Right, so it's not, you have to know everything that happened before. It's really sort of more like a two, more like two midterms. Okay, so we call it midterm and final because we hold the second one in the final exam period. But really you can think of this having, we are having two midterms. So midterm one, the first half of the class goes all the way to renewables, maybe a little bit of conventional generation. And the second part of the class, uh, three phase transformers, machines and black. That's sort of the two to parsing the class. Okay. All right, so now uh, actually in this class, so since this is a two hour class, let's take a 10 minute break. Let's, let's take a little bit break. So let's take a break and then we'll come back at the 3.35 and finish the rest of the class. All right, let's get started again. So the uh, second half of this class, again, will be a review of AC circuits or circuits in general. So this should also be, you know, so this should be stuff you have seen before. But this is just a review to uh, get some ideas of why we have the system we have today and uh, set up AC circuits for the next class. So we all know, I think most of us have seen the following picture, right? Where Thomas Edison was a champion for DC current and uh, Tesla was a you know, advocate for AC current. So I just go through the reason why they made these choices, right? Why, why... So if you look at Edison, basically Edison opened the Pro Street power plant in lower Manhattan was a hundred volt direct current generation. But the problem with this 
power plant with this power, is really on this 100 volt part. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with DC current, right? So if you can get the current to be high enough, there's nothing wrong with it, right? There's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. But the issue is at that time, the highest you could get it to was 100 volts. It was really, that's the highest you could get it to, as you know, the power plant output 100 volt of direct current. The problem was having, you know, a 100 volt or low voltage uh, at the source, at the generator, was that lower voltage means larger current for transmitting power, right? So if you look at the electric power, really we all will see this equation many times. And for the DC, this is for DC. For AC, the equation is a little bit different, a little bit different. The, for DC is P equals V times I, right? So voltage times current give you power. And the goal of the plan is of course to transmit some power, right? transmit some power to its customers. The issue with the power, with power transmission at low voltage is for the same power, low voltage leads to high current. Low voltage gives a high current. And then for given voltage, more power leads to high current. And having a high current or the lower source voltage, that's really not a good situation to be in. And we don't want to do is to have to be sort of shooting a lot of current, transferring a lot of current through the system. So the, the reason is if you, we just look at a very simple circuit, right? So this is a review of uh, electric circuits. If you look at this very simple circuit, right? So I said we have a load, a resistive load. So this is, we have R load. We have R as a load. Then we have some wire, right? So the wire have a non-zero resistance. We have a non-zero resistance as wires. Yeah. And then we're pushing some current. So the voltage we'll have across a load, is, right? So the V, this voltage across a load, this is the source voltage minus the IR voltage drop on the wire, right? This is the IR voltage drop on the wire. So you can rearrange this and then you get this load as R, R plus, our wire times Vs. So this is the voltage we achieve as a load. And the idea is most loads require certain voltage to work. So most voltage, most load requires a minimum voltage. For example, if you're charging your computer or charging your phone, then you just need a certain minimum voltage for your charger to work. Right? So you need some minimum, you need to maintain some minimum voltage at your load. But then because your load and the line resistance form a voltage divider, right? because they form a voltage divider, that means your resistance needs to be really small. And that's the issue you have, right? So this requires so our wire should be small. But it's actually quite challenging to make the wire resistance that much smaller than the load resistance, right? If you think of the actual system, of course, the wire is a conductor. Right? So we make wires using sort of good conducting materials. However, the wire can be really long, right? So again, think of your charger, right? Your phone charger. Right? Your phone charger about this big, about this big, charging your phone. Okay? 
where also wire from the generator to your home, right, from the substation to your home, goes through a really long distance. So even if you make it out of a good conductor, just because it's so long, will have appreciable resistance. Okay? So that will divide voltage, will be a voltage divider in this sense. And that's an issue because, right, for example, right, we can work out what happens when the load resistance and the wire resistance are roughly of the same order. Okay, so let's say I have the simple circuit. I have a load that's one ohm. I have a wire resistance that's sort of, you know, not uh, as large as a load resistance, but uh, you know, on the same order as a, as a load, right? Then basically, if you look at the energy and power, a lot of it has just gone through, just be, through the wire, right? So you, you have, you know, it just dissipates through the wire. Okay. So here, let's compute the voltage of the load, the ratio of the load voltages, the power, this is the energy consumed by the load, and then the energy consumed by the wire in 10 hours. And again, these for calculations should be very standard, right? should be very simple to you, right? So there's a review of the simple circuit calculations we have. So if you look at the load voltage, right? So you look at load, we have this as a voltage divider. So this is one, one plus 0.5 times 100. So we get volts. So our load is about 6.6. 66% of the source voltage, right? So this is our voltage. So we get two thirds of the voltage basically make it to the load, right? So how much energy do we consume? Well, the energy we consume as the load, this is the power we consume as the load times how long we're consuming this power. So this is just V squared over R times how long it is, right? So our low voltage is 6.7 6 squared over one times 10 hours. So you get about 44.4 kilowatt hour of power, useful power delivered to the load, delivered to the load. But, right, a large amount of power is also lost, right? So, we look at the current through the the current through the system through the wire. This is one hundred over one plus one point five amps, and then the loss, energy loss, the energy that just goes into the wire and becomes heat. Right, this is I square R loss times T. This is about 22.2 kilowatt hours. Okay. So the loss is quite high in the system, right? So right, you have an efficiency about a well, half, right? So half, the loss is half of your, or one third, your efficiency about, you know, one third of the power is lost in the line. Right. And the reason is just because you have a high wire resistance. Your wire resistance is on the same order of your load resistance. Okay. And uh, you know, to maintain a, right? So you have, when you have a low voltage, you have to push a lot of current. When you push a lot of current, this I square R basically kills you, right? This I square loss is significant. Okay. And nobody wants to operate a system Right? Nobody wants to operate a system that has about one third power loss. Okay, that's way too inefficient. That's way too inefficient. Okay. So then what can you do, right? So when Edison at that time, right? So the, uh, the, if, since you, if you cannot increase the voltage, all you got is to reduce the resistance on the line, right? On the wire. But then that's, all, that's hard, that's tricky. That's tricky because if you look at the resistance on the line, it's basically proportional 
to three things. Okay, so this rho is the resistivity of the material, basically how conductive the material is. Okay, so this is how much, so if you use copper or right, it's a how rho is a number that determines how how much resistance you have. Right, so, and then you have this uh, inversely proportional to A. A is a cross section of the wire. So basically how large the wire is. Of course, the larger the wire, the less resistance it has. Current electrons spread out more and then you have less resistance. Okay, so this is inverse proportional to A, but this is proportional to the length of the wire. So basically resistance determined by these three numbers. Right, so what can you do to you know, change resistance right, at this point? Right, so you can change resistance as you can change the three numbers you have, right? You can try to reduce row. I try to reduce row, depending on how much money you want to spend on the material of the line. So you can use copper, or if you really need a low resistivity, you can use gold. So that's a material consideration. You can try to reduce the L, Okay, then this has the health resource generator. Have a generator really close to the low. Right, so you can try to reduce that. Right? This may or may not be a viable strategy or increase A. You can make the wire thicker. Right? So this is just thicker wires to reduce it. So these are some strategies you have, right? And then none of this is very easy. None of this is very easy, right? The reason is, no, let's, right? So let's say, you know, for example, if you decide to use thicker wires, reduce resistance, they requires more material. More copper, let's say we're using copper. This is more expensive uh, to buy the line. And the second issue is actually more important in some sense. This is heavy. Lines are really, really heavy if you have a long transmission line. Okay, so it's because it's heavy, you need more poles. And this costs money. Okay. So be because you cannot step up voltage and you have to play with this, re this resistance, then you run into a lot of issues. And that's basically what Edison ran into. So Ed what Edison did is Edison ended up, you know, by being forced by the physics of the situation, have the Edison had to use many small wires. What Edison did is I, I need to use many wires. And the reason is the reason you use many wires is basically you try to set up a this thing in parallel. You try to have a parallel circuit. Right? You try to have a parallel circuit. And this reduces the effect of resistance. Right? We have a parallel circuit. Right? So you, you try to you know, do things this way. Use many smaller wires, each with a smaller R. This is very expensive. This is very expensive. And what he also tried to do is to place lots of generators all over the place. This is also very expensive. And in Manhattan, this is not really something you can do, right? And so the best thing was to increase voltage. But the problem with increasing the voltage is with technology,
was not available for DC voltages. Right? So there's really no there's really no way at that time he could have you know used these increased DC voltages. And Tesla at that time came along and Tesla said, hey, right? Tesla really understood the voltage was the issue. The Tesla was working with Edison at that time and said, no, voltage really was a problem. And the voltage was too low. It'd be much better if we ended up using higher voltage. But there's no way, at that time, there's no way, there's no switching technology yet. So they could not change the DC voltage of the system very easily at that time. In this class, we'll see how to do it. Now this, you can do this you know, trivially or you know, very easily. But at that time, it was impossible. There right? was no semiconductor switches. They could not do. But then really, Tesla was aware of this thing called a transformer. Okay, so Tesla somehow knew this technology was invented in Italy and they say, oh, there's a transformer. And the transformer, what can a transformer do? A transformer can change AC voltage, not DC voltage. Right? You need an AC waveform to change voltages. And then basically Tesla figured out the way to build a grid is really based on AC technology. As because transformers were only available for AC voltages, we, everything was AC. That was the sort of the reason why we end up using AC voltages. Right, so before that, of course, right, so that was the, how the debate worked out. Right, so you can, you know, of course, there's many interesting stories about, you know, the fight between Tesla and Edison. You can go Google or go, you know, read about them. Basically, Tesla won because really to build a viable power system, you need to be able to change voltage. Right? That's sort of the way you have to do it. So we ended up with this AC system. All right, so we ended up with this high, with this Tesla's AC system. It's basically you transform voltage when you want to transmit power over a long distance. So when you generate power, actually the voltage is quite low. The voltage is quite low coming out of the power plant. It's not very high. It goes through a step up, goes through a step up transformer, goes through a very high voltage, gets transmitted across a long distance and gets sort of stepped down uh, level by level, but so it gets closer to our homes. So it becomes the 220 or 120 voltage, 110 voltage we have in our homes. Right, so if you draw this system, basically what Tesla said is, because I have this transformer, what you should do is, you should really take advantage of the transformers. So when you have a large resistance, or if I have a long wire, Use this type of system, right? This is your load. So we have a, this is, we step up through transformer one, we step it down through transformer two. Okay, so in this class, later in the class, we'll pay a lot of attention. We'll pay a lot of attention to the transformers. Okay, so here, and the, and the idea, so the transformers really saved us in efficiency, really made the system possible. Because if you look at the transformers, right? So how much do, do they say, right? So, so this is a pretty typical number. Let's say transformer steps up the voltage from 30 to 400 kilovolts. Then we step it down back down. And this saves a lot. This saves a loss by quite a bit, right? Because here, the voltage that goes up by a factor, 
So current goes down by 13.3, but the loss is proportional to I squared R, right? So loss reduces by So this is where the, where the neat thing is. As every factor, right? So every time you step up the voltage, you, this gets counted towards, right? You get a band for the buck, right? There's a score factor there. So you can go from say 30% loss to a fractional percent loss. And indeed today, the loss in the transmission system in the power, for the power system is quite low. Okay, so you know sometimes people may think that oh really you care about the efficiency or the loss in the transmission system. That's really not the case. We don't. The loss is so small, you know, one percent maybe lower. We really don't care all that much about the I square R loss in the transmission system. We really don't pay much attention to that. Okay, we're because the voltage is so high, and the and and the resistance is quite low. That loss is insignificant. It is insignificant, right? So if you can, right? So if you have technology that can improve the loss, that's probably not very interesting. That's not a very interesting technology. But right? there's things that we care a lot more in the system, not the loss, right? And the reason we don't care about this transmission loss is just because my voltage is very, very high. I have a very, very high voltage. And so let's think about how high the voltage should be, right? So how high the voltage should be, right? So we said, you know, now we've been saying that high voltage is nice, right? So we have, you know, there's advantages. You have some smaller current. Right? So lower I squared R loss. Uh, so reduced conductor size or wire size. I don't need that heavy of a line. What are some of the disadvantages, right? Why don't we just bump the voltage to, you know, as high as possible? Uh, we don't, you know, our voltages are high, but it's limited. It's not arbitrarily high. Okay. What are some of the disadvantages of a very high voltage? What are some of the limitations that keeps us going from, say, right? Well, why not go to you know a million volts, two million volts, things like this? Any ideas? Right. So there's multiple comments in the chat, right? So one has, right. So I'm reading this, right? So one has the breakdown voltage of air. That's correct. So there's a physical limitation because air, you don't want to ionize the air. The air. Right, so eventually if the voltage is high enough, everything looks like a capacitor. So you definitely don't want the voltage to be very high, such that you look, looks like an air gap capacitor, a capacitor with air gap, right? So that's one reason, that's for a fundamental reason, cannot be very high. So you're about limit to above, you know, one million volts or so, okay, right? So you want to, this is discharge safety, right? There's a safety concern. Right, so discharge across the air gap. So basically air becomes a conductor or things become a capacitor for high enough voltages. So that's not good. Okay, so, so this needs to be more expensive. So we're limited by transformers, right? So I, you know, my transformers are only so large. So that limits the voltage, and uh, I need sort of higher towers. That's related to I need enough clearance from the ground. Right? As my voltage gets higher and higher, I need to be I need to clear the ground more and more. Okay? So when you decide what the voltage really is, there are sort of many things. Basically, it's the balance of the factors, right? So. So if you increase the voltage, right? So if you increase voltage, then really what is is it's a fixed cost. 
increases, the fixed call increases because you need bigger towers, bigger transformers, bigger switches. These are the fixed calls that goes up. But the variable cost goes down, you know, right? Because it's more efficient to transmit power. Right? So the variable cost decreases. So basically, when you decide the voltage to operate at, you're balancing this two. Right? You're balancing between these two costs. Okay? So basically, higher voltage for long distance lines. And then for a large amount of power. Okay, so we have to transmit a large amount of power over a long distance. That's when we use uh, long transmission lines, or high voltage transmission lines. And then of course voltage, you cannot design whichever voltage you want. Okay, you cannot design whichever voltage you want. But the industry has some standards, basically. You, you, can, you can pick one of these, right? So in the US, in North America, so up to tens of kilometers is 132 kV. These are the lines you probably will you'll see when you drive around in Seattle and surrounding area. <coughs> so the overhead lines, for example, you, when you drive, so there's a famous line in Bellevue. If you drive, you'll see that line. That's, I think, 132 kV line. That's for tens of kilometers. And then we have some 400 kV lines, kilovolt lines. And that's for a few hundred kilometers. We have a few 765 kV lines. Those are really long. These are some of the lines that goes, for example, uh, between Washington and Oregon, for example. You see this really high voltage lines. And uh, so Europe, I don't think even goes that high. So North America, you have some lines like that. Europe doesn't go that high. They don't have sort of very long lines. Then you have sort of this one megavolt lines. That's for very, very long distance. And mostly you see this more in China than say Europe and the US, uh, Europe and North America. There's one notable exception in the US well, for very long line. Uh, sort of one notable exception. And the notable exception is basically there is one, there is a Pacific intertie. This is a DC line. That's high voltage. This is high voltage. This is about a hundred, I think a, a thousand KVs that goes from BC all the way to California through Washington and Oregon. This is a very important line for us, for the Pacific uh, coast systems. So we have a special line. This is the one, one line we have. That's a very long distance, that's so very high voltage. And if you go somewhere in Oregon, you see sort of very large uh, substation for the specific law, right? So there's sort of very, very large substations designed for this law that goes from, basically carries power from north to south. This is a lot that built. Carry power from BC. There's, you can think of picks power from BC, Washington, the hydropower, Washington, Oregon, and then supplies power to California. And this is the special line we have. So if you drive along I-5, sometimes you see this line. In California, especially, you see this sort of big line along the highway. Highway. This is the interconnect. Okay, so this is a very important line to have for us. Okay, so then, if you look at the voltage transmission, basically, most times what we have is we start from 400 kilovolts. This is national transmission. So think of between city and city, between state and state. This gets stepped to 132 kV. This gets stepped down within a city, for example. By the time it gets to Seattle, this gets to 32, 30 kV. This is 11 kV once it goes to industrial customers. 
for example, I think our building gets an 11 kV line. The ECE building, I think, gets 11 kV line into it. And then at the residential level, you have a 120, 120 volt line. And these are very standard voltages. But all the equipment you can buy nowadays are based on the standard voltages that we have in the system. Right, so this is, this, so here was, you know, the lines we have and the different customers require different voltages, right? So if you're running a smelter, you may want 400 kV lines. If you are a large building, you want the 11 kV lines. If you're home, you want 120 volts. Right, so this is the dominant system we have today. And this is where the transmission system we'll talk about and we'll think about in this class. Right, so when you think, you know, so the first homework will be a lot of AC power calculations. And uh, you know, why do we have AC power calculations is because 99% of power is transmitted through AC lines. Right? So we have to do that. Oh, before I go on, there is a question in the chat. Is the lecture gonna be posted? Yes. So the lecture, the slides with the handwritten notes will be posted. And uh, the recorded lecture will be posted afterwards. Will be posted uh, within a day. So a uh, good question. Why is the DC the color frame line DC? We'll come to that very shortly. We'll come to why we build a DC line very shortly. And why, you know, so it's historically, Let's say Tesla, so Tesla what essentially at that time, right? Everything is, it was AC. And uh, you know, Edison tried very hard to kill the AC system, couldn't do it, really couldn't do it. And uh, there was a lot of interesting stories there. We're not, yeah. But uh, right, so why AC? So AC was just engineering much more competitive, right? Think about Edison tried very hard to kill it had no success whatsoever, had no success whatsoever. So that's one. But then why are we talking about DC, right? So that's a good question. Why are we now building DC lines? Why is the line from uh, in the Pacific coast DC and why is China building so many DC lines? Right, so one reason, that's the interesting reason is power, right? So sometimes we think, oh, we have power flow, we have communication flow, we have internet. A power system is very much different than a communication system or communication flow. And the reason is the following, reason is the following. So let's imagine, let's say we have internet, so we have a communication network. Okay, on this side. So I have a node, I have a node, I have a node. Okay. In this communication system, you can transmit whatever you want. You can transmit whatever you want through the lines. So you can transmit, you know, whatever you want. The transmissions are independent. Okay, right. How much data are you getting has no impact how much data I'm getting on the internet. Okay, this, this packets are routed independently. Packet can be routed, you know, arbitrarily up until the bandwidth of the communication link. Right? That's how internet works. Power is different. So power is actually quite different. Power is quite different. Power system is if you have a, some flow like this, these flows, are not independent, okay? Meaning you cannot arbitrarily pick out one flow and change that flow. That is not possible, right? So that is not possible in your power system. We cannot arbitrarily change a flow in a power system, okay? in AC power systems. Any ideas why? Any feelings? So we'll, co we'll cover this later, but any feelings, any intuitions, why now? In AC system, we cannot change the flow independently. 
right? Suppose, right, you know, I'm trying to flow more power from BC to California. I want to flow more power along this line. If we build an AC line, that's actually not possible. I cannot change it. So infrastructure is one thing, but you know, communication also needs infrastructure, right? So communication, let's say we built, right, right? So the communications infrastructure was fiber, let's say, right? The power, the reason there's not so much infrastructure is, is conservation of energy, not quite, right? Not quite. Because if I use a DC line, energy still has to be conser conserved. I cannot, what well, the conservation of energy, no matter what, right? that's not something I can do. Right? So John is correct, it's Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff's laws. Okay. What does Kirchhoff's laws say? Right, so think of a KVL. KVL basically says the voltage dropper across the cycle is zero. That's KVL basically. So that couples the cycle, right? KVL says voltage drop across the cycle has to be zero. But then to change power flow, change power flow, I need to change the voltage on the two ends of the lines, right? That's voltage drives power flow. But then I can't, if I change one voltage, that changes every flow on the line because K, the KVL actually shows up in the power flows. So because all the cycles have to sum up, the voltage drop has to sum up to zero, that puts a constraint on the values the flows can take, when the values of flows can take. So that means I cannot, right? I really cannot change independently. Right, so this is KVL. This is what we have for KVL. Uh, so if some of the chat, you can just unmute and ask. I, I, I don't really quite understand what the last comment means. Yeah, so this is KVL really. So anytime you have a look, you have really, you run into KVL. The KVL is a problem. It's a critical voltage law. So it's a it basically governs a voltage in a cycle. So why should why wouldn't the KVL be applied for a loop? So this is a loop, right? I'm drawing a loop. No? Right. So this is a loop with three bus. So KVL applies. That's the voltage law, right? You sum across the loop. This is the the voltage has to sum up to zero. So that puts a dependence on all the flows. That introduced basically, if you want an equation, the flow has to satisfy all the time. So you cannot pick out one of them and change arbitrarily. Right? So for example, if this is BC, this is California, I cannot flow more power just on the left edge. Okay, I cannot do that. But if I flow more power there, some other flow is changed. And Believe it or not, there's still a lawsuit going on about this, actually. So around 2000, there was a California energy crisis and so some power flow. 20 years later, we're still fighting lawsuits over this because Arizona sued and said, hey, some power flow through me. And uh, I have jurisdiction and over this and uh, certain lawsuits still going on. So this actually creates a lot of complications because if you want to flow for power through this line, power flows flow through the other two lines. So that's from. So that's why you build a DC line. The reason you build a DC line is, look, let me build a converter here. Okay, let me build an AC-DC converter here. Then I can add a DC line. Because I have a converter that sets up voltage across this two ends of the line. And that has nothing to do with the AC system now, this is actually quite decoupled from the AC system. So this line can operate you know, somewhat independent. I can flow more power through the AC line and through the DC line. If I flow power through the DC line, I don't need to worry too much about this AC system. So that's the reason we have a DC line. For long transmission lines carrying a lot of power, we'll spend money and we'll build a DC line. Right? But that's sort of, but really for that to happen, you need intercontinental or not intercontinental, but you need sort of this sort of between nation, line that's across a continent. So California to, right, BC is California. Or, you know, if we ever build a line, maybe Washington to Texas, this kind of distance will build a DC line. That's worth the effort. 
right? but we don't imagine this will happen too much in the future. Right. Okay, so, right, so this is sort of the idea of DC, how a DC line is built. This is all we're gonna say about how DC line will be built, actually. We won't say very much about this because as for, you know, we don't see that many lines or not that much application in the US, except if you go and work for that intertie, right? If you actually work on the intertie, you'll learn a lot about this DC line. But normally the way HVDC works is you have converters at each end that decouples it from the rest of AC system. And then you can control the direction of power flow. So you can, that sort of flows arbitrary, sort of arbitrary power flow. Right. So that's say how the DC voltage works. Any more questions about this? Um, yeah. So my question is like, we still have current going into the converters. So how right. does it like operate independently, like totally independently from that? Right. So you still have current going to the converter, but the idea of this current going to the converter shows, uh, reduces the load at one of the buses. So what appear in the AC system as the two load, you have sort of less load, for example, in California, right? So this current shows up as a load. You basically, it looks like the reduction of load. It looks like a reduction of load for you. Right? So what changes is the load, right? So the reason I need to transport more power is that California has higher load. So what I can do through this DC line is I can give you some current. And what this does is this reduces the low. This basically shows up as a negative low in this case. And then, which means I don't need to increase the AC transmission on this line. Or more technically, more technically, you can, the way you can think of it is this, right? Suppose what I have is I have this AC bus. So I have this AC bus. So if you remember phasers, this has some voltage and some angle, right? This bus has some voltage and some angle. Okay. If I fix this voltage on this angle, I fix the power flow in the AC network, right? I fix the power flow in the AC network. I fix voltage and angle. What I can do is through this inverter, I can create another voltage, let's say V hat and theta hat. Because this is an inverter, I'm free to create whatever V hat and theta hat I want. I'm free to create whatever I want through this V hat and theta hat. So this difference between this voltage will control the power flow in this link. But then to the rest of the AC system, because at this AC bus, my voltage and angle never change. So it doesn't impact the rest of the AC system, right? Does that make more sense? Yeah, so you basically like choose a phase that you choose like the right phase so that you don't get any load on the rest of the system. Uh, sure, you can think of that way. As yeah. you, the way to think of as AC, I fix my voltage and phase. Okay. So be, the, between me and other AC buses, the power flow stays constant. Then from the DC to AC side, from after the inverter, the inverter will choose the correct phase, you know, to give me how much power I want. Right, so inverter and me, we can. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. All right, so, right, so that's a good place to end today. All right, next class, we're going to this power flow calculation. Right, so, if, you know, what we said, right, so yeah, the so next, so today is basically overview Next class, we're going to detailed AC power flow, AC voltage, AC current, AC power flow calculation. Okay. Right, so let's end here today. I'll see you uh, on Wednesday. Thanks. Um, quick question. Yeah, sure. So is the lecture is gonna be posted after this session? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor.